Hello and thank you for watching. Today we will be discussing the 12 principles of the network economy covered in an article of Wired Magazine by Kevin Kelly. Our video presentation is by Mary Jo Arienza, Michael Shannon, and Tim Funk. The Law of Connection. Embrace the Dumb Power. The network economy is fed by the deep resonance of two stellar bangs the collapsing microcosm of chips and the exploding telecosm of connections. These sudden shifts are tearing the old laws of wealth apart and preparing territory for the emerging economy. As the size of silicone chips shrinks to microscopic, their costs shrink to microscopic as well. They become cheap and tiny enough to slip into every, and the keyword here is every, object we make. The notion that all doors in a building should contain a computer chip seemed ludicrous ten years ago, but now there is hardly a hotel door without a blinking, beeping chip. Soon, if National Semiconductor gets its way, every FedEx package will be stamped with a disposable silicone flake that smartly tracks the contents. If an ephemeral package can have a chip, so can your chair, each book, a new coat, even a basketball. Thin slices of plastic, known as smart cards, hold a throwaway chip smart enough to be your banker. Soon all manufactured objects, from tennis shoes to hammers to lampshades to cans of soup, will have embedded in them a tiny sliver of thought. The Law of Plentitude. More gives more. Curious things happen when you connect all to all. Mathematicians have proven that the sum of a network increases as the square of the number of members. In other words, as the number of nodes in a network increases arithmetically, the value of the network increases exponentially. Adding a few more members can dramatically increase the value for all members. The Law of Exponential Value Success is Nonlinear the archetypical illustration of a success explosion in a network economy is the Internet itself. <clears throat> As any old-time nethead will be quick to lecture you, the Internet was a lonely but thrilling cultural backwater for two decades before it hit the media radar. A graph of the number of Internet hosts worldwide starting in the 1960s hardly creeps above the bottom line. Then, around 1991, the global tally of hosts suddenly mushrooms exponentially arcing up to take over the world. The Law of Tipping Points Significance precedes momentum. There is yet one more lesson to take from these primeval cases of the network economy, and here another biological insight will be handy. In retrospect, one can see from these expo curves that a point exists where the momentum was so overwhelming that success became a runaway event. Success became infectious, so to speak, and spread pervasively, to the extent that it became difficult for the uninfected to avoid succumbing. For example, how long can you hold out not having a cell phone? In epidemiology, the point at which a disease has infected enough hosts that the infection moves from local illness to raging epidemic can be thought of as the tipping point. The contagion's momentum has tipped from pushing uphill against all odds to rolling downhill with all odds behind it. In biology, the tipping point of fatal diseases are fairly high, but in technology, they seem to trigger at much lower percentages of victims or members. The Law of Increasing Returns making virtuous circles. The prime law of networking is known as the law of increasing returns. Value explodes with membership and the value explosion sucks in more members, compounding the result. An old saying puts it more succinctly, them that's got shall get. The law of increasing returns is far more than the textbook notion of economies of scale. In the old rules, Henry Ford leveraged his success in selling cars to devise more efficient methods of production. This enabled Ford to sell his cars more cheaply, which created larger sales, which fueled more innovation and even better production methods, sending his company to the top. While the law of increasing returns and the economies of scale 
both rely on positive feedback loops, the former is propelled by the amazing potency of net power, and the latter isn't. First, industrial economies of scale increase value linearly, while the prime law increases value exponentially. The difference between a piggy bank and compounded interest. The law of inverse pricing. Anticipate the cheap. One curious aspect of the network economy would astound a citizen living in 1897. The very best gets cheaper each year. This rule of thumb is so ingrained in our contemporary lifestyle that we bank on it without marveling at it. But marvel we should because this paradox is a major engine of the new economy. Through most of the industrial age, consumers experienced slight improvements in quality for slight increases in price. But the arrival of the microprocessor flipped the price equation. In the information age, consumers quickly came to count on drastically superior technology for less price over time. The price and quality curves diverge so dramatically that it sometimes seems as if the better something is, the cheaper it will cost. The Law of Generosity Follow the Free if services become more valuable, the more plentiful they are, according to Law 2, and if they cost less, the better and the more valuable they become, Law 6, then the extension of this logic says that the most valuable things of all should be those that are given away. Microsoft gives away its web browser, Internet Explorer. Qualcomm, which produces Eudora, the standard email program, is given away as freeware in order to sell upgraded versions. Some 1 million copies of McAfee's antivirus software are distributed free each month. And of course, Sun passed Java out gratis, sending its stock up and launching a mini industry of Java app developers. The Law of Allegiance Feed the Web First. The distinguishing characteristic of networks is that they have no clear center and no clear outer boundaries. The vital distinction between the self, us, and the non-self, them, once exemplified by the allegiance of the industrial era organization man, becomes less meaningful in a network economy. The only inside now is whether you are on the network or off. Individual allegiance moves away from organizations and toward networks and network platforms. For example, are you a Windows or a Mac user? The Law of Devolution de Let go at the top. The tightly linked nature of any economy, but especially the network economy's ultra-connected constitution, makes it behave ecologically. The fate of individual organizations is not dependent entirely on their own merits, but also on the fate of their neighbors, their allies, their competitors, and of course on that of the immediate environment. First, unlike the industrial arc's relatively simple environment, where it was fairly clear what an optimal product looked like and where the slow-moving horizon a company should place itself, it is increasingly difficult in the network economy to discern what hills are highest and what summits are false. The Law of Displacement The Net Wins Many observers have noted the gradual displacement in our economy of materials by information. Automobiles weigh less than they once did and perform better. The missing materials have been substituted with nearly weightless high-tech know-how in the form of plastics and composite fiber materials. This displacement of mass with bits will continue in the network economy. For example, take the new logic of cars as outlined by energy visionary Amory Lovins. What could be more industrial age than automobiles? However, chips and networks can displace the industrial age in cars too. Most of the energy a car consumes is used to move the car itself, not the passenger. So if the car's body and engine can be diminished in size, less power is needed to move the car, meaning the engine can be made yet smaller, which means the car can be made yet smaller, and so on down the similar slide of compounded value that micro microprocessors follow. That's because smart materials, stuff that requires increasing knowledge to invent and make, are shrinking the steel.
the law of churn seek sustainable disequilibrium in the industrial perspective the economy was a machine that was to be tweaked to optimal efficiency and once finely tuned maintained in productive harmony companies or industries especially productive of jobs or goods had to be protected and cherished at all costs as if these firms were rare watches in a glass case it is with the network perspective companies come and go quickly careers are patchworks of vocations industries are indefinite groupings of fluctuating firms the law of inefficiencies don't solve problems in the end what does this network economy bring us economists once thought that the coming age would bring supreme productivity but in a paradox increasing technology has not led to measurable increases in productivity this is because productivity is exactly the wrong thing to care about the only ones who should worry about productivity are robots and in fact the one area of the economy that does show a rise in productivity has been the u.s and japanese manufacturing sectors which have seen about a three to five percent annual increase throughout the 1980s and into the 1990s this is exactly where you want to find productivity but we don't see productivity gains in the misnamed catch-all category the service industry and why should we as a hollywood movie that produces longer movies per dollar more productive than one that produces shorter movies Thank you for watching our video presentation on the 12 principles of the network economy. I would like to end on a quote from Kevin Kelly. Stay hungry, stay foolish.